Hello and welcome to the 8th installment of my Pokemon Generation 3 ROM hacking series. The focus of this tutorial is to exhaust the variations and uses of the message box command. After the bulk of this tutorial, we will be able to produce almost any type of message imaginable. This video will be broken down into the following segments. How do I make long strings of dialogue? How can I add color to my dialogue? And what are the different ways I can format dialogue boxes? Following these segments will be an application demonstration. In this final part, we will be creating a script that implements some of the topics talked about throughout this tutorial. Last video, we created a brand new NPC with the use of the message box command. If you decided to explore a little bit yourself, you may have come across a few issues. Shown on screen is our script from last time. Let's extend the amount of dialogue under the at talk pointer. Instead of saying I'm an NPC, we'll make him say I'm an NPC. No matter how hard I try, I can never escape this reality. After compiling and inserting, we can see that the text isn't displayed correctly. The words never drop down to the next line. In order to fix this, we need to discuss escape characters. Escape characters add extra stylistic properties to our dialogue. The first escape character we're going to use is slash n, and that's a backslash. We use this whenever we want our text to move onto the next line. However, we can only use this one time in our dialogue. If we want to continue our text onto more and more lines, we need to use the slash L. I have extended the dialogue even further to exemplify this idea. As you can see, the slash N is used when breaking to the second line of the text, and slash L is used for every other line break. When we view the results in game, it's clear that this text runs for a quite unnaturally long duration. It might look better if we split it up into separate paragraphs instead of a bunch of separate lines. We can do this by using slash p. This escape character indicates a new paragraph. Remember that if we use slash p, we're able to use slash n once again since it's the start of a new paragraph. After using slash n, we must resort back to using slash l for new lines of text. This makes our dialogue look much more natural, don't you agree? One issue I used to have with writing my own text is how many characters I should put on each line without it running off the dialog box in-game. A great rule I decided on was to never use more than 35 characters per line. From experience, I can say that 35 characters pretty much fills the entire line without running too long or too short. You can measure how many characters exist on your line by highlighting them and then looking at the bottom of XSE. The number after the select label tells us how many characters we have highlighted. Everything we just discussed was great and all, but our dialogue does seem a bit on the boring side. It's kind of lengthy with not much substance to it, so how about we spice it up? We're going to color our text. Color is something that varies across each of the Gen 3 games, so I'll be showing you every single color choice you can use and what each color actually looks like in-game. Before that, I'll be going over in general how to add a color to some specified text. To do this, simply add the desired colored code somewhere within your dialog. For instance, if I'm hacking Fire Red and want to use green text, I'll type green fr before my text. That's literally all you have to do. It's super simple. I'll post a list of the color codes in the description of this video. Make sure you're using the correct color code for your particular Gen 3 game. I'll quickly whip up a few scripts to show off what each color looks like in the different games. Ruby and Sapphire have the same codes, Fire Red and Leaf Green have the same codes, and Emerald has its own codes. As a side note, Ruby, Sapphire, and Emerald use the dark gray color code for the default NPC text. Fire Red and Leaf Green use the black color code. Other codes besides color codes exist as well. The two most important that I know of are the player and rival codes. These can be used to display the name of the player and the name of the rival. I will put these in the video's description. Last tutorial I said that using the 0x6 value as an argument to the message box command would result in no special properties being added. We're going to go over the rest of the values now. Value 0x2 is reserved for regular NPC scripts. It will automatically insert the lock, face player, and release commands into your script for you. This means that you do not have to type these commands yourself. Your script should omit them entirely and will end up looking like the one on screen. Value 0x3 is reserved for signposts. No lock, face player, or release commands are needed for signpost scripts. 
This value will change the regular dialog box design to a signpost design instead. Value 0x4 is used when you don't want your dialog box to scroll regularly or make that clicking sound when you move on to the next line. If you use this, you need to remember to use the close on key press command after the message box command, or you will not be able to exit the dialog box. Value 0x5 is reserved for yes or no questions. If you recall, when the player is asked the question, a small box will pop up allowing you to select yes or no. Depending on your response, the rest of the dialog will change. To achieve this effect, we use the 0x5 value in the message box command. After that, type compare last result 0x1. This will check if the player chose the yes option, denoted by the value 0x1. Next, type if 0x1 go to at yes. If the yes option was chosen, the script will go to the at yes pointer and continue from there. If the player chose the no option, the script will not go to the at yes pointer and just continue on with the script like usual. This means that we need to make a new section called at yes. To do this, simply type pound org at yes on a new line. After that, have the NPC say a message, then end the script. That takes care of the possibility that the player chooses yes. Now we need to go back and finish the possibility that the player chooses no. We'll be doing the same thing and have the NPC say a different message at the end of the script. That's it. Let's go back over our script to make sure we know what's going on. The first five lines set up the interaction and ask the player if he or she plays piano. We do this by utilizing the 0x5 value in the message box command. Line 6 checks if the player chose the yes option. Line 7 dictates where the script continues. If the player chose yes, the script will go to the at yes pointer and continue from there. If the player chose no, the script will continue from the next line. The NPC will respond accordingly and then the script will officially end. Viewing the result in game, it looks like everything worked out okay. We even utilized some of the color codes in the process. That's everything I wanted to cover in this tutorial. Using the information we've learned, we will create a new script which contains a series of yes or no questions. A point I want to bring up quickly here is that there are a lot of misleading or incomplete information about some of XSE's commands on the internet. There's even some wrong stuff in XSE's built-in command help menu. Some of these errors exist within the difference between the move sprite and move sprite 2 commands. Obviously we haven't gotten to these commands yet, but I just wanted to let you know. If you find that something isn't working exactly as intended, there may be extra bits of info that you need to know. Testing out commands in various situations on your own may help you decide for yourself how to use what. I'll be making sure that everything I say in my videos about these commands is as accurate as possible. I refuse to teach if I don't 100% understand something myself. An example of this is the multi-choice command. I wanted to go over how to implement multi-choice boxes in this tutorial, but I decided against it since I haven't used them too much in the past, and there is a shit ton of incorrect information on them. I'm going to take the time to test them out myself before I pass off anything to you as fact. I want to remind you that if I'm ever unsure about something, I'll try my best to remember to elaborate on it in an upcoming advice and errata video like my last one, which served as a healthy wrap-up to the mapping and tiles arc, and I suggest you watch it if you haven't already. We're about at the end of creating this script. Everything that went into making this has been taught to you through this tutorial. Hopefully you all learned something valuable from this, and if you have any questions, please feel free to ask either at Poke Community or right here in my video's comment section. Thank you so much for being my audience, and I'll be back in the ninth installment of this series.